My name is Alan Jay. I'm the Acting National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at ZOA. I'd like to welcome you all and let you know that we at ZOA hope and pray that all on this call remain safe and healthy. Tonight's program, a nonpartisan view of the Middle East in a potential Biden presidency, featuring ZOA Director of Government Relations, Dan Pollack, is the latest installment of Zoom with ZOA. Our webinars have featured members of the US Congress, Israeli ambassadors, renowned authors, and other influences, influencers in the field of Zionism and Jewish advocacy, both in the United States, in Israel, and around the world. We have a full schedule of upcoming virtual programming, and I encourage you to open your ZOA emails, follow us on social media, and check our website for upcoming programming. Don't despair if you can't tune in, or if you've missed a program, just click the YouTube icon on the top of our ZOA homepage, and you'll find all recorded Zoom with ZOA program. ZOA has been a leader in pro-Israel and pro-Jewish advocacy since 1897. Through our Center for Law and Justice, Department of Government Relations, ZOA campus, and through our regional offices around the country, ZOA shares history, facts, and truth that clearly demonstrate Israel's right to be and remain a sovereign Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley, with Jerusalem as her undivided capital and with the right to defend herself if and whenever necessary. Before we start the program, I'd like to acknowledge and thank my colleagues who are helping on this call, Steve Feldman, Jackie Schaefer, Nancy Hollander, I believe Stuart Pavlak and Sharona Whistler are probably all on. Most of those are regional directors and I thank them for their support and their help. Daniel Pollack is the Director of Government Relations for the Zionist Organization of America since 2007. Dan helps educate members of Congress, their staffs, and other government officials on the relationship between the United States and Israel, as well as on policy issues relating to the Middle East. Mr. Pollack was a submarine officer in the U.S. Navy and enjoyed a 25-year career in the information technology industry. Dan has an MS in computer science from NJIT and a BS in mathematics and statistics from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Before joining ZOA, Dan was an IT executive for the Bank of America. Dan fought against the appointment of Chaz Freeman as the chairman of the National Intelligence Council early in the Obama administration. He continues to fight to prevent Iran from achieving a military nuclear capability and makes sure that Washington understands that the Palestinian Authority has not lived up to any of the commitments in the many agreements it has signed with Israel. In the course of its work for ZOA, Mr. Pollack has written numerous opinion pieces, several articles, and has debated representatives of organizations with other viewpoints. He has appeared on Al Jazeera and on Russian and Iranian television. Dan is a member of the Jewish War Veterans, his hobbies including reading history and science fiction, computer programming, and he is a serious baseball and football fanatic. Dan lives with his wife in Silver Spring, Maryland. Hello, Dan. Hello, thanks for the great introduction. It's my pleasure and I'm glad to be doing the program with you. It's my honor and I'm gonna start this way. By my count, we're about 70 days from the presidential election and regardless of who wins the nomination, ZOA will continue to advocate for Israel and will continue to fight anti-Semitism. Since a continuation of the Trump administration would seemingly imply little or no change to current policy, today we're gonna to talk from a ZOA perspective about what a Biden administration might look like. And I'm sure you and I will mention this a few times tonight and Steve, please put it in the chat, but let me state right out of the box that ZOA is a 501c3 organization ZOA does not promote any candidate, nor does ZOA promote any particular party. This program is intended to be an academic discussion, looking at one of the possible outcomes of the upcoming election. I also want to let our audience know that we are only going to discuss elements of a potential Biden administration as they may pertain to the work that ZOA does. That is how it may affect Israel and the Jewish people. Dan, you ready to get started? I am. Cool. Uh, Vice President Biden has been in the public service for 40 plus years. The case can be made that his record on Israel is mixed. 
He has supported Israel on certain issues, but on the flip side, the argument could be made that under the Obama and Biden administration, relations with Israel were a strain. What impact, if any, will the current extreme Democratic members of Congress have on a Biden administration's position on Israel? Well, that's exactly the question, and there's a few different answers. Uh, the Biden campaign has been insisting that he is pro-Israel and has been for his 47-year career in the Congress. He was elected a, to be a senator literally as young as you can be. Probably everybody out there knows that the youngest age to be a senator is 30 years old. It's in the Constitution. He was elected when he was 29 and actually turned 30 a few days before he was sworn in. So he's really been there a long time. That was the election of 1972 and he was sworn in in 1973. So during that time, he's been quite pro-Israel as most of the Democratic Party was for much of that time. The reality that we're seeing today though is whole new pressures on all Democratic politicians, including Vice President Biden. And we've seen his reaction to that. There are a few ways to evaluate that. One is to take a look at the Democratic platform. I don't expect all of you to go read it now, but you all have the ability to do that. On um, the very end of it, pages 90 and 91, they enunciate their policy for Israel. It's not as bad as it would have been if Bernie Sanders had been the nominee, frankly. It respects the alliance with Israel. It talks about maintaining is Israel's qualitative edge in military hardware. There's a number of things in it that are reasonable. It's only when you take a look at the Republican platform that you see the difference. Uh, they are explicitly in the Democratic platform and the Biden campaign has made quite clear that they're against any unilateral moves including what they call annexation and what ZOA calls the extension of sovereignty. They claim that the move to the Jerusalem of the capital will be respected, although in fairness, at the time that it was made, uh, foreign policy advisors to Vice President Biden generally said that they thought that uh, it was premature to make that move. But now that it's been made, I think it's very difficult to undo, and I don't think he's going to do it. Vice President Biden claims that Prime Minister Netanyahu is a personal friend, but that he will be able to speak frankly to him when they disagree. And he expects to have serious disagreements. I just wanna carry, most of you are probably aware of this, but there's a kerpluffle going on right now during the Democratic convention. It's kind of illustrative of the pressures on the Democratic party. During the convention, Linda Sarsour, an advocate of BDS, and in our view, a horrible anti-Semite, spoke briefly at the Democratic convention and was, and was included in various caucus groups. When challenged on this, why would an anti-Semite be featured, the Biden campaign's uh, spokesperson said that uh, she will have no role in the administration, she's recognized as an anti-Semite, and she is not someone that they are listening to. However, a pushback occurred from the That's progressive right. wing of the Democratic Party. And basically, to make a long story short, the, uh, the highest level uh, people had a private meeting with various Muslim organizations and apologized to them, not publicly, but privately. And so now we have the situation where they seem to have walked back their condemnation of this person who's an advocate of BDS. I don't wanna go on and on. The important thing to remember about Biden big picture is that he was an important figure in the Obama Biden administration. He was so important that his name gets in there. And uh, it's not difficult to imagine essential continuity with the Obama foreign policy. It's probably fair to say that Vice President Biden was one of the least hostile people to Israel in that administration, but that's not saying much. 
It is said that he opposed, everyone's probably aware of UN Security Council Resolution 2334, which President Obama abstained on in the last few weeks of the Obama administration. It is said, at least for our consumption, that Vice President Biden opposed that move, thinking it was too hostile to Israel. We just don't know all the time. Uh, there's a lot, I'm sure we'll get to this in questions, there's a lot of information that Vice President Biden has put out about how he wants to be seen. For me, I'm always reminded of the video that all of us should be familiar with where at that time, Prime Minister Begin, when Vice President Biden was in the Senate and he started questioning him about Israel's intentions for Judea and Samaria. And Begin had to say that you can't speak to me this way. I am not a Jew uh, with, a, with a quivering knee, a trembling knees. And it's a very famous quote by Menachem Begin. And to me, that's always the danger that we ended up with that Biden who wants to lecture Israel and punish it instead of the one who has made a career of being friends. Thank you, Dan. Um, you've laid out some of uh, Vice President Biden's pro-Israel history, touched on some of the challenges we can expect from an extreme left faction of his party. Can you speak to those who may be appointed to policy-making positions? And if they come from the camp that is less friendly towards Israel, can you speak to the challenges that it could pose to the administration? And can Biden's relatively pro-Israel past prevail against these pressures? Well, they certainly could. The question is, what is the likely outcome? First thing to remember is that personnel is policy. That's kind of a buzzword here in Washington. The people you appoint to all the minor offices often have a tremendous amount of power wherever the president isn't essentially making a particular policy. Um, there are many people who worked in the Sanders campaign and who are from the wing of the party, including AOC, who will probably get jobs in the Biden administration. Let me just give you an example of some of the jobs that people don't often think about. Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. It's not really a household name, but the person who fills a job like that makes a huge difference in Washington. There are others like jobs in the USAID where aid is provided or the Drug Enforcement Agency that end up having significant effects on Middle East policy. I just wanna mention some names of people who might be high figures in the, in the Biden administration. Dennis Ross, Wendy Ch Sherman, who negotiated both the North Korean deal, which didn't work, and the Iran deal, which also didn't work. Susan Rice, enough about her. Karen Bass, who many people may not know, she was a consideration of a person for vice president, extremely progressive and uh, someone who has been very close to the government of Cuba. The most likely Secretary of Defense is thought to be Michelle Flournoy, Flournoy. Um, she's not so bad, relatively speaking. There are others who really are. Our former ambassador in Israel, uh, Shapiro, um, he could return to that job or a policymaking job in the State Department. So what all these people have in common, we're going to talk about Iran hopefully later, is uh, they all were in favor of the JCPOA, the Iran deal. They all were pretty tough on Israel during the Obama administration. The truth is um, no one knows to what degree Biden will be the pro apac Biden and to what degree he will be listening to the people who are not uh, pro apac From the ZOA's perspective, we actually have some uh, other uh, challenges other than just making sure foreign aid continues to flow to Israel. And uh, we know for sure that the things that we're most concerned about, and we'll probably talk about a couple of those in a moment, are not necessarily supported by the Biden administration. And uh, I think we'll get to that when we talk about Iran, hopefully. I, I think, Dan, I think we will get to some more detail when we get to questions. Before I get to my next question, I just want to apologize to our audience in case there's any background noise. 
uh, we here in Paramus, New Jersey experienced a very serious squall and I lost my power. And you may be hearing my generator in the background. I apologize for that. Bear with me. I'll speak a little louder so that everybody can hear. Hey, Dan, Joe Biden selected Kamala Harris uh, and she accepted to run as his vice president. I find inconsistencies in her support for Israel. Can you shed some light on the impact Kamala Harris will have on positions of the administration? Again, pertinent to ZOA's mission. Well, the first thing to know about vice presidents is they usually have to submerge their own policies and um, follow the policies of the president. That occurs when you have a strong president. One of the biggest questions about Vice President Biden is how much he is going to be in control of his own administration. No one knows this. Uh, one of the ZOA board members who happens to be a neurologist uh, gave a uh, talk on his professional opinion about Vice President Biden and his decline. And it's, it's worrying. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert myself. Senator Harris has been, until the last two years, someone who would be a reliable uh, pro-Israel vote in the Senate. Uh, she's actually married to a Jewish person, not that that makes a necessarily a difference. But unfortunately, her, her chief of staff, uh, Karine Jean-Pierre, uh, as she's running for vice president, she uh, was instrumental in urging Democratic candidates for president in 2019 to not attend the APAC conference. Uh, in Newsweek, she said, quote, you cannot call yourself a progressive while continuing to associate yourself with an organization like APAC that has often been the antithesis of what it means to be progressive. So there's some reason for concern. She really wants to have it both ways. She is currently undergoing a redefinition of her policies and some pundits have rated her the most leftist senator overall, uh, even surpassing Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, which is quite an accomplishment. One more thing I wanted to mention, uh, there's a comment and maybe we'll get to a question about it. When it comes to Senator Biden, those of you who follow ZOA's press releases to Vice President Biden, he in July attended a Muslim outreach thing. And he said, well, he ended up getting into a, uh, trying to find the notes about it here. He ended up getting into a uh, uh, difficulty where he kind of whitewashed Sharia observance. He quoted what's called a hadith, which is a saying of the prophet. And he quoted it in a, a very benign way. He quoted it as though it says, when there is an error, you have to do something about it with your hand. But the real quote in Arabic is, when there is a departure from Sharia law, you have to do something about it with the sword. And there's a big difference between those two. And that's what we're seeing with these, uh, the influence of them trying to bend over backwards to make the pro-Muslim extremists part of the Big Ten to the Democratic Party. So Dan, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna break away from my own questions for a minute because I wanna put your feet to the fire just a little bit if it's okay. No. You, you mentioned Kamala Harris's chief of staff who had at least enough, uh, you know, a, a glitch, something that we have to be concerned with. To what extent could she actually bear um, influence on decisions that the potential vice president could make? Will, they, will she wield power? and influence? Yes. Um, now the vice president only gets as much power as the president delegates to her in this case. So nobody really knows how it will work. I think that we can assume that um, Vice President Biden will, the model that he was comfortable with under President Obama was giving the vice president whole projects to work on and then letting them be in charge of them. So we don't really know what those projects would be, but yes, it could easily be something very significant like 
uh, you know, the relationship with various allies. Uh, those are things that uh, it could be. And we don't really know. We'll have to find out. It's, uh, it's, it's worrisome. All right. Thank you, Dan. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, the threat to the Middle East and to the rest of the world posed by the current Iranian regime is certainly pertinent to our mission here at ZOA. Under the Obama-Biden administration, the United States was signatory to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA. And in 2018, the Trump administration announced U.S. withdrawal from the same plan. What will likely happen to Iranian policy during a Biden administration? Yeah, I wanted to say this at the beginning. You know what? I'm not a spokesman for the uh, Biden campaign, but what I have done is paid very close attention to what their designated policy officials have said. I've been following that a lot, as many other ZOA professionals have. The key person here is Tony Blinken. He was uh, the top aide to Vice President Biden when he was in the Senate. He's been very close to him for a long time. He's been going around giving interviews to think tanks and webinars and appearing on panels. And it's very clear what he's been saying. He's, first of all, he said, someone needs to be muted, I'm afraid. First of all, he said that they want to end the policy of maximum pressure. That's the policy of the, of, of the uh, current administration, the Trump administration, which places economic pressure on Iran. It's been much more successful than the uh, Obama foreign policy team thought it would be because it started out unilateral. And the fear was that if the Europeans did not actively participate in the pressure, ultimately it wouldn't have that much effect on Iran. But it turns out that fear of American banking sanctions has driven virtually every European business and everywhere around the world business to do the best they can to observe these sanctions. So the stated goal of Blinken and other foreign policy professionals in the Biden administration would be to return to the JCPOA. But this is a very strange goal. It's probably not possible, as I'll explain in a moment. But even if it would be, the sunset provisions are so close that it's hard to see how even a Democratic president could be comfortable with Iran just after the second term of such a president, if they had two terms, would be able to freely work on a nuclear weapon and achieve a serial capacity to make many nuclear weapons, not just one. There are internal considerations in Iran as well. They're having their own election and they have hardliners. The most likely scenario is that we would let up on the pressure of maximum pressure and allow some sanctions to lapse and stop enforcing them so, so hard. And then Iran would pocket that concession and not actually return to the JCPOA. And the advisors to Vice President Biden have said that this will be a challenge and we will work with our European allies to solve this problem, you know, in concert with the European allies instead of what they perceive as being in hostility to our European allies. This does not make me feel great as a pro-Israel person. And I don't think the Israelis are very excited about the Europeans having a big role in the prognosis. As we're seeing right now with the snapback thing, I can go into more detail on that if anybody doesn't know what's going on. But our European allies are on the other side of the issue and are tacitly allowing the arms embargo on Iran to expire in October. And if uh, the snapback provisions that the United States is pushing through the Security Council are not realized, in fact, China and Russia will be allowed to sell weapons to Iran. So I'm not very comfortable with that Iran prognosis. I don't think they've really thought it all the way through from the way they've talked. I think that it will have to change and actually ironically become more hawkish once they get into power. But that isn't what they're saying now. Very interesting, and it'll be uh, interesting to see how it plays out in the event of a Biden presidency. Before I ask my, my next question, uh, I'd like to ask my colleague Jackie Schaefer to begin to post upcoming programming in the chat. 
Uh, we do have a full complement of upcoming Zuma ZOA programming, and uh, you can stay abreast of that by reading our emails, going to our website, and that will be posted. They'll be posted in the chat for your consumption. Dan, there was a stunning announcement by the Trump administration about two weeks ago <clears throat> about normalization of relations between Israel and the UAE. I know the details are changing dynamically and that a lot still needs to be hammered out. <clears throat> but every indication is still that under a second Trump administration, this effort could come to fruition. Would Vice President Biden support the UAE-Israel agreement and encourage relations with other Arab states, in your opinion? Well, he did put out a statement, and he does support it. Uh, it, it does highlight the different worldviews by key advisors. Uh, former uh, National Security Assistant, uh, the novelist, someone help me, I'm having a mental block in his name. Uh, he, he has been, uh, Steve, you wanna give me the name? Steve, you're muted. If ben you're Rhodes. Ben Rhodes. Ben Rhodes. Thank you very much. Uh, ben Rhodes has been very vocal, saying uh, it's a horrible move that disenfranchises the Palestinian Arabs. That isn't the take that uh, Vice President Biden put out. He said it was a good move. But then he very unplausibly claimed credit for the development by the environment he and President Obama had set up. This move is actually a repudiation of everything that they were trying to do, which was to reproach with Iran and to lessen the importance of Gulf states and other Arab countries in American foreign policy. In fact, I would go so far as to say that many pro-Israel people haven't really thought through what the UAE's motivation has been for this move. Their main motivation is probably to forestall a return to an anti-Saudi, anti-Gulf state foreign policy that the Obama administration was heading to by making those countries more central to the United States' foreign policy. Very difficult to ignore UAE when they're engaged in peace talks with Israel. Now, just if people haven't been following it, there's some problems now. The administration wants to sell F-35s to the UAE, and we can get into that later if we have time. But uh, my personal prognosis is uh, I think the deal is a good thing. We are having to put, the pro-Israel community is having to put our hopes for sovereignty in the immediate future on hold, but it didn't look like that was about to happen anyway. Uh, a lot of people in the left-wing foreign policy establishment are now trying to claim that the UAE deal is not a big deal, that there were already all kinds of relationships in the intelligence and military field. And I just don't agree with that as a professional. It's obvious that this is a big deal. Uh, it is uh, probably a template for three or four or five other Arab countries. And I think we're gonna be seeing a series of good announcements. And if it's taken to its logical conclusion, I urge all of you to read a Carolyn Glick column from last week, where the real big question is, is linkage, the idea that nothing can happen in that part of the world unless you solve the Palestinian Arab problem, is that dead or not? It could be totally dead, but it could also be that it's just attenuated a bit, and we'll have to see. The best case scenario is if the Arabs are really putting behind the veto that the Palestinian Arabs have expressed on any other Arab country's foreign policy dealing with Israel. And if that's true, there's all kinds of economic and strategic advantages that could accrue to Israel. I would expect Biden, it's too good a thing for American foreign policy to not build on it. So I expect them to be in favor of it, although there probably will be a divide because UAE, they're not quite as bad as Saudi Arabia in human rights, but they're not a democracy. And people who prioritize that program, the same people who were upset with Egypt, including, by the way, probable Secretary of Defense of uh, Fortnoy, have been very critical of human rights abuses in our Arab allies. And so I don't know that the Biden administration would get away from serious criticism of those countries, but it's a step in the right direction. I hope that answers yeah. that question. 
Oh, I answered the question for sure. So before we ask questions from uh, the audience, I want to remind everybody that they can post questions in the chat feature. We're about to start asking questions. I want to remind everybody one more time that ZOA is a 501c3 and we do not <clears throat> promote one candidate or the other. We do not promote one party or the other. So Dan, when you and I talked about doing this program, we knew that there might be some difficult questions and I'm, I'm sure that we're going to get a couple now. Um, Can I say and, one thing? Uh, of course. Uh, I see that Claire Lopez is putting th facts into chat. If anybody doesn't know her, she's a tremendous resource on these issues. I thank her for being here. And, uh, and if we don't and get I'm her glad, questions, everyone I'm should I'm glad that you, you brought up Claire. Yeah. So I'm just going to read Claire's questions so that it is accurate. In fact, that there are two. I'm going to aggregate them so you can answer them all at once. A few weeks ago, Biden spoke to Engage Act, the PAC for the CARE front group, Engage USA. Given that CARE is the U.S. branch of Hamas and that Engage USA endorsed Biden already back in April of 2020, an endorsement of Biden did not reject, how can Biden possibly be seen as pro-Israel? And Claire follows up with that one of Biden's senior advisors, Farouk Mita, who is closely associated with the Muslim Brotherhood and its umbrella group, USCMO, and asks the same question, how on earth can Biden be considered pro-Israel? Well, the last thing in the world I ever want to do is be corrected by Claire Lopez. She knows her facts, and those are all facts. Uh, what I meant by saying that he considers himself pro-Israel is that's what he says. It's always been an interesting question about what does it mean to be pro-Israel? Can you be pro-Israel if you have someone like Linda Sarsour in your corner? If you have these other people, if you are, I think the answer that many Democrats would give, honestly, to Claire and to questions like this is, he's a politician and he's pandering. <laughs> and then the question is, he's working now to get their support. You know, sometimes this happens to us too. Uh, for example, Barack Obama said many times during his run for the presidency, he said things that would please pro-Israel people during the campaign, only to govern as he did in a, in a decidingly not pro-Israel way. So there's a political process that he's going through. I think it's a fair question to say, how can we even use the words pro-Israel in that context? Certainly by ZOA standard, few things that Vice President Biden stands for are really pro-Israel. But you have to be honest, there were Democratic candidates in the race who were worse and had worse endorsements, worse staff people, and worse uh, uh, ideas for the future. So uh, it's unclear just how closely to the old Biden he's going to be. I hope that answers the question. Next. Yeah, Dan, there was a, a, a recent, you used the word before, I love it, kerfuffle, I think it was worse, where Linda Sarsour, who obviously is no friend to Israel and the Jewish people, uh, made statements that were found to be offensive. And it's reported that Biden's people actually apologized to Linda Sarsour. Can you speak to that incident? And do you believe that they did make an apology and was it sincere? And does that impact his, the way that he would act as president? Well, this episode isn't really over yet. The people who made the apologies off the record included this uh, Blinken and uh, key high officials in the campaign. They took responsibility for the lower level person who criticized Sarsour. Again, I don't know, you know, to be honest with you, this is a classic political uh, difficulty for any candidate. How do you deal and, and President uh, Trump has it too. He has some people who are supporting him who are almost an embarrassment, you know, in terms of some of their other positions, for example, being advocates of, you know, various conspiracy theories. So the thing that a politician wants to do, and I'm not defending this, but this is what they do. They try to pocket the support and try to have it both ways so that, I mean, you know, let's be honest, people running for office are not the paragon of virtues, of consistency, or any, any virtues that you can name. And uh, I think this is an example of that. 
It is outrageous. ZOA has called on him. The very least we can do as a pro-Israel community is place the pressure on the campaigns. They can't afford to ignore us when we're bringing them to moral account and it shouldn't be a free thing. That's what's so terrible about all the Jewish groups that are in the tank for the Democratic Party. You would think that organizations like the ADL would be looking at their mission statement and trying to stop anti-Semitism as the first priority and running interference for candidates either as a lesser priority or not at all. But this is one of the things that's occurred. There hasn't been enough pushback. Just do the thought experiment if a KKK person was on a major party's you know, political campaign committee or the equivalent. That's what we have here. We have people who are hate-filled, beyond the pale, unacceptable in advocating for BDS. And the fact that they are only uh, feeling the heat from the left is something we have to do something about. Yeah, I'm gonna use the, I'm gonna use the terms that are used in the question and I'll let you either correct the term or use the terms that, that we would use from a Zionist Organization of America perspective. But what would you project would be a Biden administration's approach toward the current, and I put this well in quotes, settlements? Yeah, we call them, uh, of course, uh, communities in Judea and Samaria. It's, the Democratic platform is clear and, and Biden's advisors have been clear. They will be opposed to the expansion of settlements. It's unclear if they mean even natural, you know, when a, when a, when a person in a, in a community in Judea and Samaria has a baby, is that an expansion? The population has gone up by one. It's unclear exactly what they mean, but it's not good. We know a little bit about it. Again, it was the Biden, well, the Obama-Biden administration. And we know that any time, any plans for any building at all in Judea and Samaria were considered, the Israeli authorities got severe pushback, even to the point where things that were announced years before and moved to the next level, a big, a big uh, brouhaha was made uh, when, when each of those steps occurred. It was really torture for any Israeli policymakers. And so if you're in the nationalist camp in Israel, and you're planning on moving to one of these communities in Judea and Samaria, you'd best do it before the Biden administration takes over because the United States will exert considerable pressure on Israel. The wrong-headed view that is held by people of this ilk is that the communities in Judea and Samaria are the chief obstacle, in the words of Ben Rhodes, for example, to moving forward with peace agreements. It's absurd to anyone who has visited Israel and I encourage everyone to go on the ZOA mission and you can get a chance to see a lot of these communities close up. And they are not in, they are not in any way, as we see from the Trump peace plan, peace can be thought of and, and from the UAE deal can be executed in the absence of any concern about Judea and Samaria. And there are so many great questions here and we do have time. So I'm gonna keep going. Hopefully we'll get to most of them. There's a, there's a question here, and you touched on it a little bit, talking about the neurologist that we know here at ZOA who assessed Biden from his professional point of view. And the question here is, should we assume that Biden will fill out his term? Now, I know you're not a medical professional, but should he not, whose voices would we hear? What happens in that case if Biden is not able to, if Vice President Biden isn't able to fulfill his uh, presidency or his term? Actually, uh, there's a really interesting scenario here that very few people are knowledgeable about. I see my former colleague, Josh London, is in the uh, audience, and he's someone who knows this. But if the really interesting thing is if Vice President Biden should resign between the election and when the Electoral College meets, many people have wrong assumptions about what could happen. It is not true that the Vice President simply assumes the mantle of the president who was elected on election day. The electoral college still has to go through the actual votes. You have separate votes for president and vice president in the electoral college, according to the constitution. And many, many things could happen. The parties would have no role 
after election day in helping to determine who it is. So those actual electors who were sworn to vote for Biden, assuming he won the election, would, if he was not available as a candidate, in most states, they would be able to vote for anyone at all. It's, it goes to state law. It was just a Supreme Court decision. So that's a really interesting scenario if that happens then. And it's not necessarily true that those people would automatically select Harris. Uh, they would have to vote for her for vice president. Fascinating. After, Fascinating. after uh, inauguration day, any removal from office is a thing called the 25th Amendment where you can be removed involuntarily for reasons of health. If the vice president and half of the cabinet agrees, uh, of course, then Harris would become president. I just can't give you any insight. I, I just don't know as to how likely that is. It's certainly a scenario that we have to be prepared for, but I just don't have any particular expertise at how likely it would be. This next question, Dan, is going to call on your powers of speculation, but it's such an interesting question. This great country and the way our government is organized, we have checks and balances, right, with Congress and the presidency. What role would Congress play, what role might Congress play, to either temper or support a Biden administration's support or not support of Israel? Where do you see the Congress going? Well, that depends on what the Congress consists of. In addition to the president, we have the House and the Senate essentially up for grabs. Most uh, observers think the House will remain democratic, although if President Trump achieves a great victory, uh, one could conceive of it, it switching. The Senate is very much in play. There are a few key races that are very close, potentially, and we still have a good bit of time. If all three bodies go to the Democrats, stand by. Uh, basically, a lot of uh, probably the filibuster would be done away with, and all of the Democratic, some of the most extreme ideas would probably be enacted into law. Because right now, the Senate is the thing that stops it and the presence of the filibuster. Uh, it's not so much even that the Republicans control the Senate as that you need 60 votes to accomplish most anything. And no really radical legislation can achieve those 60 votes. But if they do away with the filibuster, it's a, it's a whole new game. When it comes to foreign policy, the executive branch really has the lead. People can always pass, there's a thing called the War Powers Act. They can put limits on the president's ability. When the president's party controls both houses of Congress, traditionally, the driving force doesn't come from Congress. They are part of the team and uh, the president and his advisors will be formulating policy and generally be supported uh, by the House and Senate if they're all Democrats. If the Republicans keep control of the Senate, we pretty much have, uh, you know, any move, for example, to punish Israel if they don't play ball with a particular Iran deal would be stopped in the Senate, for example. But it's unclear what the prognosis is right now. It's very difficult to lead foreign policy from the House or Senate. Uh, there's a couple of people who are really important. And one of the things that's going to be decided is the chairmanship because Engel lost of the House Foreign Relations Committee. And that's a very important battle. There's a progressive from Texas, Castro, who's up for the spot. He would be really bad news for Israel. Then there's uh, Mort's friend, Brad Sherman, who's a Democrat, but traditionally more reasonable. Uh, and then there's um, Meeks from New York, and he would be somewhere in the middle. He's just did a flip-flop uh, and trying to announce how, how pro-Israel he is, um, although he's he's from New York, so he's not as bad as the, as some of the others. I'm going to try and get to a few more questions, Dan. From ZLA National Board Member Len Getz, do you think the Biden administration will choose a UN ambassador as pro-Israel as the ones Trump has, for example, Nikki Haley? No. I think that we have some names for who might be the UN ambassador. I think it will be someone in the tradition of Susan Rice, uh, someone who uh, is close to the Obama-Biden foreign policy nucleus, someone who's in favor 
I mean, the very first thing that will happen is Iran policy will, you know, instantly become much less hard line. And of course, the Europeans are waiting for that to happen. That's the rationale for them not joining with the United States for additional pressure on Iran right now. So no, I, I, I think all the people that have been put forward as possible UN ambassadors, one of the people is actually Budacek that is being mentioned as a UN ambassador. Uh, I'm not sure why. I don't think that he has particularly foreign policy expertise, but he's kind of similar to Nikki Haley's uh, profile before she entered a young, vibrant person that, that would, you know, if he would be it, I would be very concerned. Because he's, his pro Israel, his Israel positions were uh, third worst, maybe, of all the candidates when he was running for president. Right. You, you gave a shout out to your colleague and our friend, Josh London, he asks a question. Do you think a Biden victory might lead the Democratic Party in the short term to further dispense with the pro-Israel kabuki style so often preferred by APAC and the other related bland wagon alphabet soup Jewish groups? Well, you left out the very first part of Josh's comment, which was... Yes, I did. You great job, seen. Dan. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, you know, Josh, and all the rest of us on the call know too, one can't say enough about the alphabet soup of Jewish groups and how feckless they have been when it comes to ensuring that the Jewish community's vital interests are safeguarded. I don't know that Biden's election will cause, I think it will cause APAC to have a huge sigh of relief. Uh, they think that Biden is their kind of guy. And I think that they will believe that they can return to the situation as it was normal back, which they consider the Clinton administration. However, as is so often the case, reality has actually changed on them. The so-called bipartisan consensus is gone. The Democratic Party is intrinsically going to have to listen to the inputs of the AOC branch, the Sanders branch, and those people are not going to let up the pressure. Starting the day after the election, Sanders says, they're going to fight for the soul of the Democratic Party. So what I expect to see happen there is appeasement, which is the time-honored way of these people, and the Jewish community trying to fight a rearguard action to prevent really bad people from ending up in really bad slots. But I don't think they will be totally successful. And I think the Kabuki style will continue, actually. Uh, announcing victory based on style and continued aid to Israel, while actual policy changes really more follow the Obama-Biden template. Hope that Sticking answers. with the theme of the alphabet soup, Dan, um, how influential is J Street, maybe others, but J Street specifically in advising a Biden administration? Interesting question. Many people don't realize that J Street's uh, genesis was to give uh, Barack Obama, when he was running against Hillary, a way to attack Jews who said that Obama wasn't strong enough on Israel. So their roots go back to the anti-Hillary part of the party, the Barack Obama part. And uh, many people think that the power structure in today's Democratic Party is really the Obama loyalists, actually, and that they are the ones who were most important at selecting Harris and uh, putting forward that slate. And they may very well have a great deal of influence in personnel. So the question then is, how influential will J Street be? The answer is, I think significantly. They have embedded themselves at think tanks. There is now a long list of people who have served in APAC and are gone off to other organizations. They're really, you can't go to a webinar without seeing a person who used to be a J Street official, having a, uh, you know, a sage, uh, you know, seemingly mainstream role in the Democratic Party. So I fear that it is a fact that they have uh, done really well. Ironically, in one of their original roles, which was to undercut APAC, they've kind of done some of it, but they are still not respected 
when it comes to their policy pronouncements in the House and Senate compared to APEC, and of course, the ZOA. Dan, we're coming to the close of the hour, and I want to give you a chance to give some final thoughts, comments, uh, remind our audience about what ZOA's mission is and what we're doing, and then I'll close the program. So you have the floor for the next few minutes. Your closing thoughts, please. Well, I've seen that trying to look at some of these comments. Many people have extremely um, cogent comments. I definitely agree that the intelligence community, which we haven't talked about, is a key uh, appointment and has a big, a lot to do with the Israel relationship. The good news there is, uh, well, ZOA, for those of you who don't know, I mean, you're here, so you must know, this is a very lonely fight we're engaging in, and we need your help. We need to have our voice amplified and everything any of you can do to get your friends involved in ZOA to help us, you know, our fights are still there. We're still looking for sovereignty to occur, even though it's not on the agenda uh, with the way things have gone with the UAE. We're still looking to get sanctions on Iran and with the ultimate knowledge that sanctions aren't going to solve the problem. Uh, we have to be prepared for a military response if necessary. And we, the United States, I mean, uh, we have a lot of fights to do and all of you need to give some thought as to what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, it's great for me to talk and the other ones of us who are professionals up here to do our jobs, but without everyone in the ZOA community going the extra mile, and that means financially and with your time, uh, we don't get it done. So that's what I wanted to make an appeal for. Uh, our work is unfinished and it is true. I mean, I, I feared a little bit that my comments would be, you know, that how can we even envision a future where Biden is president? We have to envision it. It's a distinct possibility. And ZOA is not closing up shop. I'm going to be doing my job, and all of us are, and doing the best we can for the American-Israel relationship in that scenario. But it's going to be more challenging. And uh, again, I have my own political views, and I'm not going to espouse them now. But I urge all of you who care about Israel to vote with Israel in mind. Thank you. Dan, I want to just thank you from the bottom of my heart as a friend and as a professional for sharing your expertise. I learned a lot. I know our audience learned a lot. You stole a little bit of my thunder because I had a close that was very similar to your own. And it went something like this. These things are certain. The election will take place. We will have a president after the election and ZOA will be here to advocate for Israel's safety, independence, and sovereignty. So thank you again. Uh, for those of you in the audience, the work that ZOA does does cost money. We need your support. If you've been enjoying our webinars and if you have the ability, we'll post in the, in the chat. You can go to our website and help us financially. We look forward to seeing you uh, in the future. Dan, in his close, mentioned uh, that there are things that you can do. Look in the future, one of our upcoming webinars is going to be hosted by Steve Feldman, who is helping us on this call. It's going to be an, advo an advocacy tutorial among many other programs. So we wish for everybody around this great country who's joined us tonight, health, safety, continue to fight for Israel, continue to fight anti-Semitism, be safe and stay healthy. And this ends our program for this evening. Dan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.